You guys love our worship team at all? New Heights music, be paying attention. We're trying to put some stuff together for iTunes and Spotify and wherever else you, you know, I just want to be able to, I just want to be able to take New Heights music with me. That's what I want. I want to be able to play it in my car, you know? Now I have to go and like go back to the YouTube service. I fast forward to that one spot, you know, that I got to remember where it is. I just want it on iTunes. Can you say amen to that? Can you lift one hand and pray with me? Father, I'm asking now that your people would hear your voice today and not mine. That your word would shape us, change us, and mold us like only you can do. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated in the house of the Lord. Or stand up. I don't care. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter number 28. I'm going to read a few scriptures here in a minute, but I just kind of want to take you to where we are in the scripture before we start reading there. See, Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, it's very important that he is the Son of God. It is also important that he is the son of man. Because in the book of Genesis, dominion and authority, responsibility over earth was given to man. Man kind of dropped the ball. Come on, somebody. Or can I say it differently? Picked up the fruit. When that happened, sin entered the world. Well, the Bible also says, because you can't just read the Bible, you have to read the Bible. And you interpret the Bible with the Bible. And the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons, and he also does not give his gifts and then take them back. So if he gave you something that was a gift, he's not fixing to snatch it from you. That's why you see so many people with outlandish charisma serving the devil. That's a gift from God. Some people have an incredible mind, an incredible creative mind, and they just use it for wickedness all the days of their life. That's, that's because God put that gift in them, but he literally didn't take it from them whenever they began to use it uh, incorrectly. So when mankind sinned, authority and dominion, that responsibility was not taken from mankind. So what needed to happen on planet earth was there needed to be a human that would come and facilitate what God had actually originally planned whenever he spoke, whenever he spoke Adam into existence, formed him, breathed life into him, whenever he literally caused mankind to exist, to have a soul, to be walking around on planet earth, he needed a man to come and fulfill what man could only fulfill. That's why Jesus constantly called himself the son of man. He is the son of God, but he's also the son of man. One of the greatest questions you can ask anybody that that doesn't necessarily believe in Jesus is just go, okay, who's his dad? Because you are the child of who made you. You You are the son or the daughter of who made you. This is why it is so absolutely critical to understand the reality that Mary, uh, Mary, whenever she was pregnant, she was a virgin. God the Father in heaven, through the power of the Holy Spirit, put the seed of life on the inside of Mary. Now, When this happened, all of of creation began to absolutely go crazy. All the, the, the demonic leaders of the world began to try to kill all the babies to try to get the right one, which is exactly what he's doing now, by the way. It's the same thing that they did in the days of of the Israelites and the Egyptians with Moses. As soon as he saw the people of Israel, the Israelites began to rise up. They decided they were going to kill all the babies. And they ended up putting uh, Moses in a a, a, a basket, put him in the river. And then he was raised in 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 the Pharaoh's household. But what happens is every time that somebody starts to rise up, there's always going to be an uprising against him. You see what I'm saying? So the son of God and the son of man came, was born to a virgin, lived 30 years or so, and then he started his ministry. Matter of fact, in the Bible, we don't have a whole lot of information between when he was born and about 30 years. 
And then about 30 years, we see, after about 30 years, we see about three years compressed into four different books called the canons, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or the Gospels. And, and what we see is Jesus Christ was consistently about his father's business. Matter of fact, the one picture that we have when he was about 12 years old, he goes missing. How would you like to be that parent? You didn't just lose your kid, you lost God's kid. I could just imagine God being like, Mary, how did you lose Jesus? And she's like, like you don't know where he is. <laughs> so they get, they get separated and Jesus is actually at church. He's at the temple and he's talking with, with uh, people that are scholars in, in the word of the day, the, the current uh, form of the Bible, if it were. And, and they came and said, Jesus, we, you know, we were missing you. We didn't know where you were. He said, this is very beautiful. He said, you should have known, Mom, that I would be about my father's business. What is the business of the father? The business of the father is to reconcile creation with the creator. The business of the father is to ensure that when you stop breathing here, you inhale the aromas of heaven. That's the business of the father. The Bible says that around 30 years old, his ministry started. He went about doing all sorts of good. Uh, one place, it says, if we tried to write down everything Jesus did, there's not enough books in the world that would hold all the good things that he did. So this is just a glimmer. So what you do, if you want to know what God is like, because Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form for us to see. The Godhead is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So he represents, he, was, he had the Holy Spirit come and rest on him. The Bible says that the Father spoke whenever he was baptized. And the Bible says that when he spoke, he said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. It's a picture of the Godhead. And Jesus was the fullness thereof walking around. Now remember, you can't translate the Bible with something else. You have to translate the Bible with the Bible. And the, the, the Lord has also made it very clear that he doesn't change. Now, this is important because whatever Jesus was doing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is what Jesus is doing today. So if he was healing the sick, does anybody agree that he was healing the sick in the gospels? Then he's healing the sick today. You know the only people that he was really critical with? Religious jerks. Can you say jerk in church? I shouldn't have asked Jake. He says all kind of stuff in church. <laughs> Religious people that tried to make it challenging to get to God. These are the people he was critical with. Those that were outcast and downtrodden and maybe even a bit of a rascal. That's the one that it was almost like drew him like a magnet. And so he lived this sinless life for us as an example. And then comes the time for him to die. And he says, no man can take my life, but I'm going to lay it down. And they arrested him, not the Romans. The Jewish leaders arrested him in the garden. And when they arrested him, they drug him and they declared him guilty of things that he wasn't guilty of. He didn't speak up much. They drug him before the Romans, not because they, they needed the Romans to declare him guilty. They drug him before the Romans because they could not legally kill him and they wanted Jesus to die. So they asked the Romans to do it. So they take him and, and most of the Roman leadership that he went in front of they said, we don't find any fault in him. But the religious people of the day said, well, we need to kill him anyway. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And they took him and they, 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 they beat him. They laid lashes on his back until his body looked like ribbons. And I don't know exactly how many lashes it was. I know a lot of people argue that it's 39. Believe me, I've read it a million times. However, we don't know exactly for sure how many lashes it was. Was it probably 39? Probably. But what I do know 
It was the exact amount necessary to purchase the health and healing for every person that will ever live. The Bible says that after they did this, they mocked him, they put a, a purple robe on him and a crown of thorns, and they drove it into his head, and his head began to bleed. Now, it's beautiful because the Bible also says that you have the mind of Christ. But the Bible also says, without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement. So the fact that he was willing to bleed here means your head could actually be redeemed. So the Bible continues, and he, he takes his, his cross. They put it on him and make him carry it up the hill. They nail him to it. All kind of things happen. One of the things that he says is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I want to make it clear, we shouldn't, we shouldn't point our fingers at the people who killed him. Because the truth of it is, everybody had scales on their eyes at that time. And the fact that Jesus died, that was established before the foundation of the world. Jesus is not plan B. Don't you get to heaven and be like, Adam, you really screwed up. Because let me tell you what, if he hadn't, you would have. Come on, somebody. Probably before noon. The truth of the matter is, when, when uh, Jesus gave his life, he sat there, on, he was on that cross, suspended between heaven and earth as, as it will. There's a scripture in John chapter 12, and it says, if I will be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me in reference to his crucifixion. So what happened is there was a gap between earth and heaven that humanity could not cross. And the only way to build that bridge was two wooden beams stained in the Savior's blood. And now when you call on God, you do not have to tell him what you did right today. You can just tell him, Jesus Christ set me free. The blood of, I'm not coming to you in my own name. I'm coming to you in the name of your son, Jesus. I plead the blood over my life. I plead the blood over my family. I plead the blood over my marriage. I plead the blood over my business. I'm not going about this life like I'm not connected to something. I'm connected to something. I'm connected to the highest power of powers that is. I am not talking like I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know exactly what it will look like, and I can't tell you exactly how it's going to trail off. But I guarantee before this thing's over, it's going to be stacks of victory on top of victory on top of victory because of that blood-stained cross that set us free. Then right in the last moment, he said, it is finished. They bring him off of the cross, and the Bible says that uh, the Sabbath was nearing, so they had to hurry. And a guy named Joseph of Arimathea comes and begs Pontius for the body of Jesus Christ. And they wrap his body in, in linens and they, 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 they pour oil on him. And he says, not only that, he said, I have a tomb. He said, I have a grave that nobody's ever laid in. We can put Jesus there. And I'm sure Joseph, I'm sure he had faith. But at the same time, what he didn't know is Jesus wasn't going to need it very long. So Jesus was laid in a borrowed tomb. The Bible says that the religious zealots of the day came to Pilate and said, here's the problem. He said, these Jews, they're going to steal Jesus' body. He said, those fanatics, they're going to steal Jesus' body, and they're going to say that he rose from the dead because he's been walking around saying he's going to raise from the dead. So the leadership said, well, here's what we're going to do. He said, I'm going to roll a big stone in front of it. I'm going to put some guard there. I'm going to put some guys to guard it, and I'm going to seal it. In other words, they would, they would, they would put it there, and then they would seal it most likely it was some form of wax. And what that would do is if the seal was broken, then they knew somebody had messed with the scenario. So they sealed it and, and they set it there. And then all of a sudden we get to Matthew chapter number 28. In the end of the Sabbath, verse number one, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and Mary and the other Mary to the sepulcher. That's Mary Magdalene and Jesus' mom, Mary. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Did you know God is in the business of rolling stuff out of the way that has been holding you in your entire life? You may have walked in here and depression has tried to jump on you since you were a child, but I decree and I declare that the God of heaven and earth has sent an angelic intervention today to roll back what has kept you locked up. 
The Bible says there was an earthquake, the angel descended, and then it begins to describe the angel. Just picture this for a second. Because this is not like a fable. This is actually what happened. They looked at the angel and countenance, we would translate the word appearance most likely in 2021. His appearance was like lightning. And his raiment or his clothing or his covering was white as snow. I don't know about you, but I like the fact that there are angels that have charge over me. The Bible says they protect me. They keep me from even hurting my foot, the Bible says. These angels are not little baby angels. Come on, somebody. Come on, they're not flying around with a little arrow. You know what I'm talking about? These things are like lightning. I know it's Easter Sunday morning. We may have some visitors, but we're just kind of the same church all the time. Praise the Lord. I've seen some angels. And let me tell you, it will surprise you if you've ever looked and you've seen something that you know kind of looks like a person, but you also realize could absolutely rip this building in half in like a microsecond. Furthermore, when the enemy left heaven, the Bible says one third fell. That means there's twice as many angelic entities that are still fighting for you than there are against you. Like lightning they come. What are they? They're white as snow. Why? Because they live in the presence of God. The Bible says they looked and they, the, the Bible says for fear of him, for fear of the angels, the guard or the keepers began to shake. One translation says to, to tremor, almost like, uh, almost like paralyzed. And they became as dead men. So the guard was sitting there watching, and all of a sudden they see this angel, and when they saw the angel, they began to shake and quake, fell on the ground as if they were dead. And the angel answered and said unto the women, now this is a huge, this is a huge dichotomy here. There's two different things happening at the same time. The, the, the fear of God when the, when the guards saw the angel caused them to shake and be as if they were dead but the answer the angel spoke to the women and said fear not somebody say fear not not. you guys are like on a scale of one to ten you are like a 12 today fear not for i know that you seek jesus which was crucified if you're taking notes write this down the guards needed to be afraid and i'll tell you why Because they weren't seeking Jesus. They were trying to stop people from getting to him. Mary and Mary Magdalene, nothing to be afraid of. Why? Because you seek Jesus. The biggest difference in this story is who are you seeking? Are you seeking Jesus? If you're seeking Jesus, there's nothing to be afraid of. Not a diagnosis, not a threat, not I don't think it's going to work out, not my kids aren't living right, my kids aren't doing right. If you seek Jesus, fear and Jesus are not congruent. But if you don't, and I mean this very respectfully, if you don't, if you had any concept of what you were heading toward, you would be paralyzed and shaking in fear on the ground. If you had any concept of what your future was actually going to look like, if you do not seek Jesus Christ. The Bible says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There are many other ways. They just don't lead where Jesus leads. There are many other ideas. They just don't lead where Jesus leads. So if you don't know him, if you could just see in the spirit for a moment and see the type of hosts that take care of and see that God's word comes to pass, you would probably be on the ground right now foaming at the mouth in fear. Because the only reason to not be afraid is not because you have everything figured out. The only reason to not be afraid is not because you were born in the correct nation. 
The only reason to not be afraid is not because you, you, you were born on the right side of the track or the wrong side of the track and it toughened you up. The only reason to not be afraid is you seek Jesus. Because the scripture says, if you seek him, come on somebody, you will find him. So the, 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 you got the picture. You got the two ladies, the angels sitting there talking. You got the, the, the guards, at least two of them that are laying on the ground, uh, petrified. And he says to them, he says, fear not. I know you seek Jesus, which was crucified. Now we're just gonna read a few verses this morning, but we're on, on verse five right now. It's absolutely imperative that you never let anybody Take the beauty of the crucifixion out of your doctrine. If he wasn't crucified, then your sins were not paid for. So almost every time you see the resurrection spoken of, they make a quick, a quick reference to the crucifixion. Do you remember the Apostle Paul who was like a Pharisee of Pharisees, which means he knew, about, he knew more about the Bible of that day than pretty much everybody else, and he like killed Christians and, and sat by as other Christians were killed, and he would arrest them, and then all of a sudden he runs into Jesus, and Jesus literally sets him free, changes him, changes his name from Saul to Paul, and, and, and he becomes this, this paramount apostle in the very, very early church. This is what, this is what he became. You see, the Apostle Paul was something very special when it comes to the early church because he carried all the credentials of all the religious zealots, but he considered them dung. He said, I don't come to you with eloquent speech. And in many places, he would talk like this. He said, I could. He said, if I was gonna brag, I would brag about this. And he would list all these incredible accolades. He said, but instead, I don't come to you with that. I come to you and I preach Christ crucified. The reason he preached crucifixion, the reason he preached Christ crucified is because pretty much everybody knew Jesus was still alive. The Bible says in Acts chapter number one that he walked around for 40 days and by many infallible proofs, he showed himself alive. It wasn't a secret that Jesus was alive. That's why they changed the narrative. God bless everybody. I'm not mad at anybody. We're trying to reach everybody. But did you know that Islamic faith believes Jesus ascended to heaven exactly like we do? They even believe he was born to a virgin. They don't believe he was crucified. If he wasn't crucified, then we're in trouble. Because Elijah did very similar to what Jesus did in Acts chapter 1. Elijah ascended to heaven, but Elijah didn't save your soul. Enoch walked with God and was no more, but he didn't save your soul. So the devil changed his plan from let me see if I can kill Jesus, which he thought he did, but Jesus laid his life down, to then he immediately flipped it to say, well, he never died anyway. which was crucified. Somebody say crucified. If he wasn't crucified, we're in trouble. So the angel says, he says, he says, I know you seek Jesus, which was crucified. Verse six, he is not here for he is risen. He is not here for he is risen, comma, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. As he said said he is risen exactly as he said he was going to at New Heights Church. We understand this is the year of the arena. This is the year of Bible study. We're gonna be far more Bible literate one year from now than we are today. If he rose from the dead, just like he said, my question for you is this, what else did he say? Because the minute you find out somebody is a liar, you can't listen to anything they say through the same lens. But the minute you find out somebody's honest, the minute you find out somebody is able, now God is able to do, exceeding abundantly above more than you can ask or think. It's one thing when somebody's willing. It's a whole nother thing when they're willing and able. When you find out that our God is not dishonest, he's not a liar, then the next question is, what else did you say? Did you say my children would serve you to a thousand generations? Then I believe it and I don't care what I see right now. 
Did you say, by his stripes, I'm healed? I heard the diagnosis. I'm not sticking my head in the sand, but I decree and I declare the one who rose from the dead has the final say over my health. The one who rose from the dead has the final say over my family. The Bible says he'll give you a peaceful habitation. I dare you to start believing God for a beautiful house that's filled with peace and love and joy. He said it, I can have it. If he said it, I can have it. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ died for you and me. How many of you believe that he rose from the dead for you and me? Did you know your belief changes your life, but it doesn't change somebody else's? Your belief is the catalyst for what you experience. So if he said it, I believe it, but that affects me. Jesus rose from the dead as he said. The next question for believers. Now, if you're not a believer, I'm going to help you with that in just a minute. But if you're a believer, the next question is, what else did he say? Is there something I'm not walking in? Can can I ask it differently? What promises are laying dormant in your life because we haven't fully believed what he said. What promises are laying dormant because they're stuck on the pages of your Bible and they're not written on the table of your heart? You see what I'm saying? The guard, you better be afraid. Anybody tries to keep Jesus from the people, you better be afraid. It may not be today. But there is a reckoning coming. But if you seek him, there's nothing to be afraid of. You don't have to live your life looking over your shoulder. There's nothing to be afraid of. But if he said he was going to rise from the dead and he did, my question is, what else did you say, Jesus? Did you say you would bless me in my coming in and by going out? Then I'm going to stand on it. Did you say I'm the righteousness of God in Christ? That means I'm not what I used to be. Old things pass away and all things become new. I'm not going to live my life in bondage anymore to these ideas and these things that I did because he said that my slate has been wiped clean. If he said it, that settles it. The question is, what else did he say? You could spend the rest of your life just looking for what? did he say? What did he say that I can believe? What did he say that I can put my faith on? When I'm going through something, the first thing I want is a scripture. Because if he said it, no devil in hell can stop it. But it has to, it has to be deep on the inside of you to the place that you refuse to let it go. To the place that you refuse to let it, let it, let it sit there dormant. But you don't just have to believe it. You got to know it first. You can't believe something you don't know. You can't believe something that you don't know. That's why, listen to me, I know it's it's Easter, and I know maybe some of you were talked into coming because somebody, you know, like convinced you and, and, and all these things. But I'm telling you, you are about to be completely converted. You walked into a setup. The Holy Spirit is about to invade this room and it is going to be undeniable and your entire life is going to change forever. You're going to go home and your kids are going to be like, who are you? And you're going to be like, I don't know. I just feel so new. Many of your children right now are giving their life to Jesus in our children's church. But you got to find out what he said because literally... If what he said about rising from the dead is true, then everything else he said is true. Just as he said. He said, come see the place. Verse 7. Go quickly. Somebody say quickly. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I've told you. 
So the angel says, who's bringing and carrying the word of the Lord, he said, quickly go and tell his disciples. That's the same word God has for us today. Go and tell somebody. He said, he goes before you. Did you know he still goes before you and makes a way for you? They departed quickly from the tomb or the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. I love it when people have passion. I love it when people have effort. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail, which is to say greetings or hello. Don't you know they were shocked? And they came and they held him by his feet and worshiped him. And they said unto him, and Jesus said unto them, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren, referencing his disciples, that they need to go to Galilee and there shall they see me. I want to unpack two or three things right here very quickly. Then we're going to wrap up. Matter of fact, it may take five minutes. If you're willing to give me just five minutes, just lift one hand. Five more minutes. Lift them high. All right, 5, 10, 15, 20. They went to tell his disciples, and Jesus met them, and they held him by his feet and worshiped him. The times in my life. it just felt like I was just holding on to the stability that only the feet of Jesus can bring I find it beautiful that they only met Jesus when they began to do what they were told to do if they'd have sat at the tomb they wouldn't have seen him But the minute they began to walk in obedience, that's when he showed up. Most of the time in your life and my life, an encounter with God is not you waiting on him. It's him waiting on you to do what he said to do. If he said, go, go. If he says, go tell him, go tell him. So well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you go tell my disciples, I'm going to meet them there, meet them there. They began to run. Listen, this is Easter Sunday, 2021. The world is different. You may have been, the last time you were in church might have been Easter 2020 or 2019. I'm here to tell you that if you really want to meet Jesus, you can't leave here the same. You have to do what he said. Well, who am I going to tell? You're going to tell everybody that has ears. You're going to tell your coworker. You're going to tell your, your cousin, your niece, your uncle, your nephew. You're going to tell your neighbor. Hey, I just got to tell you about Jesus. He, he really changed me. That's why I don't know what to say. Nobody knows what to say until you start talking. And then the power of Almighty God, the Holy Spirit, will begin to help lead you and guide you. But if you want an encounter with God, I'll tell you where the encounter is. It's in the dead center of your obedience. He says, go, you stay. You'll probably be there by yourself. He says, go, you go. You'll find him in the way. Because he goes... Before you. That's really what he did on the cross. We were all in line waiting on judgment. And the Son of Man skipped all of us and went before us. He said, Brian will never taste death. Susie will never taste death. Walker will never taste death. Because he went before us. But it didn't end there. 
it ended with an empty tomb and a people set ablaze. The people that were terrified of what might happen to them if they got caught being a follower of Jesus now could care less if everybody knew. Because the difference is this. If you seek him, there's nothing to be afraid of. If you try to hold him in, you better be scared. Because you can't hold in this lion. He's a king, soon returning. And today is your day to give your life to him. Either for the first time or the first time in a long time. Maybe you're here today and you've never made the commitment. Maybe you've never believed fully in your heart and confess with your mouth that he's Lord. I'm not a religious person. I'm just free. And I want to offer to you the freedom that only our king brings. Every light bulb, every song, every thread of carpet that you walked on was purchased in hopes that you would come to know our King, be made whole and free, and live your life for Him. Many encounters are for you as you walk out your life in obedience to what He says. But it starts with a decision. He did die. He did rise from the dead, but it has no bearing on your life if you don't believe it and seek him.